Hey, what's up, Spartan Nation, and welcome to another episode of the Spartan Nation podcast here with your host, Matt Lonsberry, and my co-host, Aiden Mulcrone. And uh, yeah, kind of a special Sunday evening edition of the Spartan Nation podcast tonight um, as we react to uh, the news over the weekend that Michigan State has hired its next head football coach, and it is, in fact, Oregon State's Jonathan Smith, who comes over from Corvallis. Uh, where he spent uh, six seasons as the coach of the Beavers. Um, he's a former uh, four-year starter uh, or uh, for Oregon State um, during the um, late 90s and early 2000s. Um, his junior year, he led uh, Oregon State to uh, uh, an 11-1 record and a Fiesta Bowl win. Um, I think they finished number four in the AP poll that season, and uh, he is... Uh, um, kind of a legend from or in the Oregon State circle, so it was, um, I want to say, a coup to to go into Oregon State and and pull and pull him from his alma mater. But um, that's kind of what happened uh, this weekend. It happened very quickly. Uh, I think we talked on uh, I can't remember if it was Wednesday or Thursday of last week, Aiden, but when when some of this news with with Jonathan Smith was starting to pick up steam, and um, and yeah, it happened very quickly. Uh, Michigan State plays its uh, regular season finale on Friday, and um, and then the next day, uh, right in the middle of the day, right in the middle of the Michigan Ohio State game, uh, the the hire gets announced, and uh, and yeah, a new a new era of, of Michigan State football. So I guess your reaction now, Aiden, to uh, the official news that it is in fact Jonathan Smith, and uh, and where you think this program is headed now under his direction. Yeah, I mean, kind of like we talked about, I know you've been really high on him and he's been kind of your number one candidate for a while now. So um, I'm sure I'm sure you're excited. Uh, yeah. But at the at the same. So I think I think this is a good hire. Right. Um, you know, it's it's probably not the the home run, like kind of knock your socks off hire that people were looking for with, you know, an Urban Meyer. But right. he is. Um, you know, very sound. You you can tell that. Um, you know the way he coaches his teams, and I think the biggest thing for Michigan State right now is stability, and I think he provides a lot of that. Uh, you can you can tell from from their program and the way he's built them up the last three years that they have a lot of stability, and that that's something that's that's huge. I think the the coaching staff that he brings with him is also important we can you know we can talk about kind of some of these assistants uh yeah. later on but yeah i think i think there's a great hire i think uh you know alan haller has done really well uh you know not only with this hire but with kind of every single hire that he's made so far in, in every uh every sport for msu and you know he he was thorough about it so I think that's that's important. I think you know there there's a lot of guys that are on this staff who, um, you know, aren't big name guys. But I think as as we see, you know, Michigan State on you know, you know, Jonathan Smith at Michigan State. I think as we see this program grow, I think some of these assistants are going to grow into some some bigger name, you know, coaches that could could get hired at other places for either you know, the role that they're in for more money or kind of a larger role. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, good coaches on, on that, on that, uh, that list of assistants that are, you know, currently, currently, uh, being brought on. So I think that list is going to grow. Um, I'll be, I'll be interested to see kind of who he brings from the, from the outside, um, outside of Oregon state. But I, overall, I, I think this is a, a good hire, uh, for this program and just for the university. Yeah, no, as you said, um, you know, Smith kind of emerged for me as, as kind of my favorite of the, of the pool that was kind of out there. Um, even, uh, it, it seems like the first uh, couple of weeks after Mel Tucker was fired, uh, we started talking about, um, the, the, the list of candidates, you know, you wrote several articles about, you know, different guys that, that Michigan state could, could target. And um, it did like it, from the beginning, kind of both of us, the, the ones that really jumped out right away were, were Mike Elko over at Duke. Uh, Smith was one of those guys that jumped out quickly. Um, and then maybe a Lance Leipold from Kansas and uh, Chris Kleiman from Kansas State. 
Um, and yeah, so as far as Jonathan Smith, I think, um, you know, I, I had this thought over the weekend after his, his hire was, was finalized. Um, and I hadn't thought this before, but it kind of just occurred to me. He's kind of the opposite of Mel Tucker. If you, if you just kind of look at him, like his personality wise, like just a little bit of, I've seen from, from some interviews, post game interviews, um, that I've watched since, since, um, he was hired. Um, he's not a, and I, not that I have to avoid taking shots at Mel Tucker because we all know how that uh, era ended and it wasn't pretty, but um, he's less, he's less chauvinistic. Uh, he's more, he just seems more and more down to earth and, um, and a football guy. Uh, another, another example would be, you know, Tucker was a, a defensive minded coach and, 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 um, Jonathan Smith is more of an offensive guy. Um, he, he came up through the coaching ranks, uh, coaching quarterbacks. Um, and he's worked under uh, Chris Peterson, who's an offensive minded coach. So a um, lot of differences between those two. And I think that's probably a, a, something of a welcome change now for for the Michigan State faithful, just because of, you know, how the the Mel Tucker era went. Um, but, yeah, you mentioned the assistant coaches. We'll get into that a little bit um, later as as he's brought several uh, from, from Oregon state with him. And then there's been some rumblings about possibly, you know, Courtney Hawkins and, and Harlan Barnett potentially uh, staying on staff for Michigan state and in some capacity, not sure like what roles those will be um, or, or if they will in fact happen, those aren't official yet. So, uh, but there's been a little bit of uh, discussion mm -hmm. about that um, uh, right away. Uh, Steve, he, he brings it with a big comment. I'm not going to leave it up here because it's, it's a large comment, but he, you know, notes the, the importance of recruiting. Um, I, uh, I do think Midwest recruiting is something that Michigan state does need to uh, get back into and, and really mm -hmm. um, pour a lot of effort into, uh, especially the, the state of Ohio. Uh, and this was mm -hmm. mentioned on, it seemed like the broadcast uh, for the, the Penn state game um, and other discussion that I've, that I've seen, uh, there's just there's like five or six players from Ohio on on Michigan State's roster currently, and that's a far cry from what it was under D'Antonio. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to the 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 Michigan the Ohio State game that happened uh, this last Saturday, you know, at the end of that game, you have a Rod Moore uh, make a, a game clinching interception. That's a former three star kid out of Ohio. That's the kind of kid that that D'Antonio thrived. A recruiting, bring to East Lansing, and then turn it into um, really good players. And that's what I think Michigan State needs to get back to. So um, what's your level of concern, I guess, with with uh, Jonathan Smith, just the fact that he's a West Coast guy and um, bringing, bringing at least half of uh, his, his coaching staff with him at this point. You, you get 10 on-field assistants. Uh, so far, five are coming along with him. Um, but not many of those guys have uh, have Midwest ties. So what's your kind of uh, thought with that, um, knowing the importance of getting back into Ohio? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really important. And while I do think Steve makes a good point that, you know, they need to recruit your pretty much every program is recruiting at a national level. Now, I do think that, you know, you look at Michigan and kind of Michigan does recruit at a national level. But then you look at the backbone of their team, like you were talking about with, um, you know, a Rod Moore or, you know, even a J.J. McCarthy is from Illinois. So, sure. it, you you know, you have these guys from and Donovan Edwards, you know, another dude. So, like, having the backbone of that program should still be Ohio and Michigan and the Midwest. So while you go out and get those or try to get those, you know, four-star recruits uh, or five, four- and five-star recruits out of, you know, Texas, Florida, Georgia, California, you still want majority of your program built up out of, you know, Michigan and Ohio. And I think there there is one coach uh, that I'm trying – I'm looking right now. It's the tight, uh, tight ends coach, Brian Wozniak, played at Wisconsin and yep. is from Ohio. So – Having a guy with Ohio ties, I know the the defensive backs coach Blue Adams, who is expected to be hired. Um, you know he's he's out of Flo he's from Florida, but he went to Cincinnati, so that you know he kind of has some ties back back to the Midwest in in some form. So I think uh, you know that's important, and I I think the the recruiting staff that they're gonna either keep from msu may help them because i know mark DeThorne 
is a, a Midwestern guy, you know, you know, this is his first, this was his first year at Michigan state, but he also, you know, was around the Midwest. He was at Pitt before then, um, you know, so I, I know that their, their recruiting staff or the recruiting department has mis Midwestern ties. So I think, you know, you know, recruiting departments are growing and growing every year just sure. because of the importance of that. So I think keeping keeping those guys or at least some of those guys on staff is important to to really hold those Midwestern ties just so, you know, that transition from Corvallis to East Lansing goes smoothly. And I think, you know, if, if that's really kind of what it is and everyone's bought in, I think it shouldn't be, um, you know, that that big of an issue. Yeah, so I, I wanted to throw up uh, Illust Eggplant's question about offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. Uh, one of the assistants that uh, Smith brought with him from Oregon State is uh, quarterbacks coach uh, Br Brian Lindgren, and he is the or he was the offensive coordinator over there at Oregon State. So I would assume that he is going to be the offensive coordinator at Michigan State. Um, they've been uh, Smith and uh, Lindgren have uh, worked together. Um, for well, since he since uh, Smith was hired at Oregon State in 2018, that was his first season. Um, Lindgren has been uh, his offensive coordinator and his quarterbacks coach, so mm -hmm. um, they have uh, a lot of chemistry. A lot of um, they've been together for six years, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that's will be uh, the offensive coordinator. The defensive coordinator not decided yet. Um, I know um, there's been some talk about uh, maybe Oregon state or Smith bringing Oregon state's defensive coordinator with him as well. Um, the name is escaping me at the, at the moment. Uh, Trent Bray, I think it's Trent Bray. Is his okay. Name. Trent Bray. Uh, but he is a potential uh, candidate for Oregon state to, mm -hmm. to replace Smith. So um, I think that could be something that if it does happen, it might take some time um, and we'll have to see how uh things play out with with that whole situation because obviously now Oregon State is looking for uh, a replacement and um, with with the success that Smith had there especially over these last three years um, it makes some sense for Oregon State to want to try to uh, keep some continuity um, and um, maybe promote from within uh, Smith's staff so we'll see how that situation plays out um dave asked about the contract situation i've not heard anything official yet but i i've been pretty unplugged today just uh for personal reasons but uh, i haven't heard anything specific have you heard anything uh aiden i've i've not heard any of the specifics of his contract i know he was making around 4.9 million at oregon state so i think uh yeah i i think he's gonna make probably double that would be my guess or you know around the eight million dollar range uh and for i know for a fact though that you know there's been posts about kind of the the assistant coaching pool and that is larger than uh what he's getting at oregon state and what uh mel tucker has gotten at michigan state the the past three or four years which i think was around the i want to say it was around the 12 or 13 million dollar range uh, for, for that assistance pool. So, you know, get, getting more than that, that, that helps. I think that that gives you enough options to, um, go get a, a big time defensive coordinator considering Trent Bray is, uh, still looking at the Oregon state job. I know for, uh, I know that he is also an Oregon state alum. So I think that that is a factor that could go in for him, you know, along with being a first time head coach. So, there's that. And I think that also gives you room to go hire maybe another recruiter, uh, out of, you know, that has Michigan ties, uh, you know, maybe I say this jokingly, but maybe a, a Vince Morrow who from Kentucky, who maybe MSU fans in the past have thought they could get, um, it, 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 it is a little bit silly cause he's, he's kind of a, a goofy dude, but, uh, you know, he, he gets recruits out of Michigan. So, that's you know that's a huge thing and that's something that they they need to prioritize and i think they will so that that talent pool gets you a lot more money to you you know get you better coaches yeah no i i agree with you um i thought this was a good question for, for from liam he asked uh, how would you describe what uh michigan state's future offensive identity will be like under jonathan smith um 
I think it's going to be pretty balanced. Uh, Oregon State, they like to run the football, and and they had a very good offensive line um, while while Smith was at, especially these last couple of years um, while Smith was over there. Uh, I think the the 2001 uh, Oregon State team, maybe the 2022 Oregon State team, I can't remember which, um, but they were in line. They were a finalist for the uh, Joe Moore Award. Uh, which goes to the nation's uh, top offensive line. That's the award that Michigan has won each of the last two seasons. Um, and so one of those seasons, uh, Oregon State was a finalist. And so they're going to bring that physical uh, smash mouth uh, element. But um, I think it's it's not, they won't be restricted to that, I, uh, though. I think, I think this will be a balanced offensive attack. But, I mean, that's got to be uh, music to, to Michigan State fans' ears to hear that, um, you know, they're bringing over the the offensive line coach from Oregon State as well. Uh, his name is um, I'm I'm gonna butcher this last name, but it's uh, Jim uh, Mikalzik Mikalzik uh, something similar to that. I'm, I'm like I said, I probably butchered that, but uh, again, uh, a guy who's been in the industry for a long time has produced some good results over there at Oregon State, and that's something that Michigan State has really struggled with over. I mean, throughout the the whole Mel Tucker era. Uh, the offensive line, I would say, underperformed uh, for the ma- for the majority of of the time. Um, I think uh, Kenneth Walker obviously masked a lot of issues in 2021, but we've seen those issues these last two years, um, and it's been pretty ugly. So you bring in some fresh blood along the offensive line, and uh, hopefully that success comes with it, uh, bringing in bringing in um, just a, a new voice to to some of these guys. Who I will say that I, uh, I thought uh, uh, Chris Kaplovich he recruited fairly well uh, the position so i think there is some talent for um for uh the oregon state offensive line coach whose name i'm butchering uh to to work with uh, going forward um mm-hmm. so so i think that's but what are your thoughts i guess on this question aiden about offensive identity what are your what are your kind of uh, impressions yeah for, so my kind of impressions in like in a simple form would be that you know like you said they they they're balanced but they they want to run smash mouth football and i think you're gonna try you're gonna kind of see what michigan state did um in a sense from 20 you know 11 to 2015 kind of that that prime d'antonio era you're kind of gonna see a similar style but with a little with more creativity i think you know you're gonna see something like that so i think it's you know they want to run the ball. They want to play power football, but there is creativity um, in the play calling in, you know, the, the passing game, you know, he, he understands that, you know, that this day and age that, you know, a spread offense is kind of a, a hot commodity and, you know, players enjoy playing in it. And I think he wants to bring some aspects of that, but also kind of stay to the roots of, you know, power football and kind of run it down your throat. And I think that's what really attracted Alan Haller and just Michigan state to be a fit for, for this job with Smith is kind of the mindset that he has in that sense offensively. So I think, I think, like I said, you're going to see kind of old school MSU football with, with more creativity is is what you're going to get out of that. No, I no, I agree with you. And I, I think, um, for one thing, uh, Michigan State fans are ready to just see some some new uh, blood, play calling, new yeah. blood for sure. Um, you know, initially, you know, there was a little bit of confusion on Saturday when when this hire first got uh, announced about uh, Michigan State's current coach, or I guess I, I shouldn't say current coaching staff, but the last coaching staff. Um, like the initial report came out that you know everybody had been dismissed and fired, um, which might have been partially true but then the, some things about Courtney Smith the the wide receivers coach and and Harlan Barnett who was obviously he coached DBs and was the interim um, mm-hmm. there's been some things about him about them potentially being retained uh, by Jonathan Smith so you know those things are still working themselves out here um, but yeah for the most part uh, new blood new new ideas um, uh, that's that's something that you know Michigan State fans are certainly ready to see, and I agree with Eggplant here as well. He says, you know, Smith doesn't seem flashy. Um, this is kind of speaks to what I was talking about earlier about you know the differences between him and Tucker. Um, you know, sometimes uh, y- you look at a guy like, and this is an extreme example, I, I admit, but a guy like Dion who has so much just natural charisma and and all of that stuff, like that can work for for certain guys, but then you have these other these other guys who are just 
uh, football junkies. And if you're an offensive guy, it's you, they kind of have, um, you know, defensive guys. When you when you think defensive coach, uh, you think about uh, a Mark D'Antonio and kind of the scowl that he always had. Uh, and I mean that in a good way. And some of the and that that uh, that bruteness, that toughness, uh, offensive guys, you you, you kind of think of, you know, a guy with uh He's, he's tapping the pencil to his brain and he's, you know, he's thinking about, he's, you know, he's, he's thinking about, you know, what, what kind of ways can we gain advantages? I think that's what the kind of guy who, who Jonathan Smith is. He seems like a guy who is always looking for those, those advantages, those edges. Um, and I think that's going to be a, a welcome change as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, you know, the way that Mel Tucker kind of approached things w- was very differently. I think, you know, he, he approached it with, you know, the talent, you know, you got to find the best talent to to compete and win. And that's what he did. He went out and recruited, you know, the best talent. Did he always get the best talent? No, but he did get some very key pieces in this MSU team right now, um, you know, in the transfer portal and, you know, through recruiting high school ranks, you know, obviously Caden Hauser, Sam Levitt, both four stars. You know, you look on the defense, Jordan Hall, Jaden Mangum, Dylan Tatum, all four-star guys. So, you know, there's two different philosophies that, you know, one, and then you have Smith's philosophy, which is kind of development and kind of, well, part of it was the restrictions he had because, you know, Corvallis is kind of an isolated place without any recruiting hotbeds around it. But he had to develop guys and out-scheme, uh, you know, opposing teams more so than, than what Michigan State had to do in terms of the talent advantage. So there's no one right or wrong way, but the, be- I mean, obviously you look at a team like Georgia where it, you know, they got the best of both worlds where it's like, they got the, the best talent in the country mixed with some of the best coaching in the country. You, you're starting to see that a little bit with Oregon. You're starting to see that with Texas. So I think with Smith having an X's and O's first kind of approach, I think that's something that MSU needed at least in the in recent kind of you know history in the last three four years um kind of where they went wrong was it felt like there was a lack of stability but the talent is still there so yeah i think i think that that's key um to look at it and i think that you know going back to the the assistant coaches i think courtney hawkins i think we've talked about this ever since uh you know, the news in October of, of Mel Tucker being fired that I think he's worth keeping on the staff. Uh, he does have Michigan, you know, roots and ties. So yeah. I think that's important. And I think that's, you know, probably why we haven't heard uh, of a wide receivers coach being hired yet. Uh, but I could be wrong. But yeah, I think I think that would be the, the you know, the pick here if, if you had to keep, you know, one assistant. Yeah, no, I think if there's if there has been a guy from the previous staff who um, I don't want to say has earned the right to stay because, you know, that's not something that <laughs> that's not something you can really say about uh, the, the previous era. But he has been he's recruited well. Um, he's developed well. You think about Jaden Reed. You think about uh, Jalen Naylor, uh, Keon Coleman before he transferred to to Florida State. He came in as a raw um, a very athletic, but, but raw, um, wide receiver prospect and has turned into, you know, one of the best wide receivers in the country. And, uh, even, even when Keon, you know, departed the program, he had that, that interview that he did. Um, and he, and he said, you know, the reason why he, he chose Michigan state was because of Courtney Hawkins and the fact that he's, he played in the NFL and had a lot of that, uh, experience. Um, I think, I think Hawkins NFL background is attractive to young, uh, wide receiver prospects because that's where they ultimately want to get. Um, so I, I think that would be, uh, to your point, I think it's, um, it's one of those that I wouldn't have a problem with, with Courtney Hawkins staying on as the wide receivers coach. Um, and I think it is, it is kind of important, um, not vital necessarily, but I think there's something to be said about, um, having, some people in the building who do have those ties to Michigan State. Mm-hmm. Um, Courtney Hawkins played here. Um, he can 
uh, inform these other uh, coaches who are coming over. Hey, this is what we're about here. This is what is important to our fan base. This is what's important to our alumni. All of those types of things. Um, you can, you can introduce. I mean, and then again, this this goes beyond um, the duties of a coach. But like, you're you can be introduced to to donors and people and and who are you know have have influence with the university. So there's something to be said for that as well. Um, Harlan Barnett is kind of the interesting one for me, just because. Um, Obviously, struggled as the interim coach this year as far as a wins and loss record. I do think Harlan Barnett deserves a lot of credit for keeping the roster together. Um, I think Michigan State finished with you know, five or six uh, transfers or guys who left the program after um, Mel Tucker was fired. And I feel like that number could have been a whole lot higher than it, than it was. And I think um, Barnett deserves a lot of credit for the job that he did. Um, holding things together. I know that the product was not pretty. I'm not defending the product that we saw on the field. Um, but again, to keep the roster together, to keep um, the, the team united and things like that going forward, I think he deserves uh, commendation for that. Um, as far as an on-field coach, where are you at with Harlan, uh, uh, Aiden? Would you like to see him take on more of a, maybe an analyst role or do you think he should be an on-field coach? Where, where are you at with that? Yeah, I think... I don't, I don't think he should be in an on-field role. I think, you know, the hire of Blue Adams kind of showed that. It's not, you know, okay. if he does stay on staff, it's not going to be in that role. I think it's going to be something closer to kind of what Mark D'Antonio is now as, a, as an advisor. And, you know, he, he does love this university. He's, he expressed that in this, uh, you know, the past few months that, you know, he really still cares about this university. Um, no matter what happened, but I think, you know, the best thing for him, yeah, is to be an analyst or kind of an advisor and, and take a step back, uh, maybe, you know, reevaluate, kind of help be a guide with some of the players who stay for Jonathan Smith. So that, yeah, I mean, I, th I think his time is, is coming gone. I think he, you know, was really he was a, a great coach for MSU under D'Antonio and right. he he did kind of what MSU needed him to do and, and he just kind of has run his course at this point. Yeah, I'm kind of with you as well. Uh, there's something to be said again. I I, I don't want to repeat myself, but because you know Barnett was in those shoes this last year, um, I think he can pass on some, some knowledge and some wisdom to, to Smith. Mm -hmm. I mean, Harlan Barnett's been a coach now since, since 2004, that's, that's nearly 20 years of experience. Um, and the majority of that has been here in East Lansing. Um, to your point, he has, uh, been here for, for some of the highest highs of the last, um, you know, for the last 20 years for sure. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be uh, said for that. There's, there's, there's value there. Um, but you got to work out, you got to weigh that against, you know, what's best for the program moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, you know, personality fits, things like that. So it'll um, be interesting to see how that plays out. And obviously we'll, we'll keep a, a close eye on that going forward. Um, there is a couple other questions in the comment section. Um, you know, Dave asked about uh, Nick Marsh, uh, the wide receiver from uh, River Roge, who is currently Michigan State's highest ranked uh, prospect. You know, signing day is in about uh, just under a month. I think uh, I think signing day is on the 20th of December. Um, that th this speaks a little bit to the um, Courtney Hawkins thing as well, because you know Hawkins was the primary recruiter for Nick Marsh. I think he would be um, to, to answer Dave's question. I think Marsh is probably more closely tied to Hawkins than he is mm -hmm. to to Harlan, uh, just because yeah. you know Barnett was a defensive coach. Um, so that could be a factor here as well. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Nick Marsh does seem pretty well, uh, I don't want to say cemented because nothing is cemented in recruiting until, until, uh, pen meets paper. And now with the, with the, the transfer rules, it's that even then is it's not, uh, uh, necessarily set in stone, but, um, Nick Marsh does seem pretty solid to, to Michigan state at this point. Um, I'm sure he'll be continually recruited over the next three weeks. Um, but just wanted to answer the question there. I think it's more tied to, to Hawkins potentially. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Steve asked about, uh, do you think MSU is willing to do everything it takes to build a national program, uh, using the SEC model that each football program is separate endeavor from the athletic department and university structure? I don't know if I agree with the second part of that question. Um, but I do think, you know, when you look at, 
uh, the contract that Michigan State threw at Mel Tucker. Now we at, at this point, with the benefit of hindsight, we know it was ill-advised. Um, but because of the uh, way that Tucker concluded his uh, tenure in East Lansing, you know, you kind of got a mulligan a little with, with a little bit with that because you're you're not going to have to pay him the full fully guaranteed. Uh, 80 million that was left on his on his contract you might have to pay a chunk of that in a settlement eventually down the road but um you know you, you kind of again a mulligan i think is a good word there so i think they i think michigan state is committed to um to being a national program i think that's the uh that's the door that that mark d'antonio opened when he you know started winning big 10 titles here again um, won three of them i think michigan state finished in the top six in three seasons under d'antonio um and i think there's only maybe eight programs nationally who have done that since uh 2000 or whenever whenever it was so it, it's it's uh it's it's tight company company there's not many who have done it so um i think we all kind of agreed that maybe there was another step that could be take taken post the the Antonio era. We thought maybe Mel Tucker could be that guy. He clearly wasn't. Um, can Smith be that guy? I'm not sure yet. Like that's that's kind of down the road, and and we'll see what it looks like um, next year and going forward. But um, I do think Michigan State is willing to be a national program. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think they're definitely set to be a, a national program and try to, you know contend with you know the big 10 now which you know there's no there's no division so i think that makes life a little easier but you're still going to be competing against michigan every year and you're going to have a rotating schedule where you're going to face you know oregon washington ohio state penn state usc um you know probably play two or three of those teams every year for you know as long as long as the Big Ten is looking like this, I know next year they still they have to play. I think Michigan, Oregon, and Ohio State, or Michigan, Oregon, Penn State. So it's it's going to be a tough schedule, but I think with the twelve team playoff, I think there that makes it a little bit easier. I think MSU, it, uh, I would expect MSU kind of within the next four to five years under Smith, you know, assuming it all goes, you know, smoothly that they would be competing for the 12 team playoff uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I don't, I don't really expect him to go in and win, you know, three big 10 titles, but I do think there is an expectation to bring them back to kind of prominence of, you know, being a top 25 team winning eight or nine games a year, never missing a bowl game. I think I think that that's kind of the expectation right now for me, at least. Yeah, no, we'll definitely get into uh, early goals for for next season. Probably, mm -hmm. I have I have that as well. I think one of my burning questions that we'll finish the show with. So we'll get into that for sure. Um, real quickly, since we have you know some more more people than normal uh, tonight, uh, which we appreciate the the viewership, but I just wanted to uh, let, let you guys know. Go ahead and, and head over to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our U YouTube channel. We would appreciate that. Helps us with um, just being able to produce more content for you guys. So we would appreciate that. Um, getting back into uh, fan questions here, um, you know, my buddy Matt McCartney says, uh, Michigan State's in a full reset. How many years do you think Smith needs uh, for you know that full reset and making Michigan State relevant again? This is an interesting question because um, one of the things that was in uh, Jonathan Smith's uh, statement that he released after he was hired, um, it was kind of towards the end of his statement, and he said, you know, there's no shortcuts here. Um, he kind of reiterated that in a video that went kind of out on social media today about um, there's he's not going to candy coat it, that there's there's work to do. Um, and um, this isn't going to be uh, some some immediate switch. Like, I don't think Michigan State's winning 11 games next year. Like, I don't think that's on the, in the table. So mm -hmm. there, there's work to do here. So um, maybe maybe we're getting into the, the burning question segment here a little bit uh, with this one. Aiden, but I guess what is your what does your trajectory look like? Like, what do you what do you want to see um, next season and then going forward as as he builds this program? What are some of the, the the top goals or the top aspirations? I guess. Yeah, I think next year the goal should be at least a bowl game. I think that yep. I think that's you know fair to him and fair to the players. I I think you know that should be kind of the bare minimum goal 
just because I do think MSU was closer to a bowl game that, than a lot of people, you know, give them credit for. I mean, they lose to at Iowa on one possession. They blow a lead against Rutgers. They, you know, even losing to Maryland that, you know, that's not really acceptable. I think that, you know, losing some of those games was definitely on coaching hundred uh, percent. You know, we, we talked about, you know, the special teams and things like that. I think he, if he straightens that out, I think a bowl game is easily attainable um, and really kind of the bare minimum of expectations. And I don't really think you can ask for more than that um, out of at year one. I think year two is kind of bring in that recruiting club, you know, bring in a good recruiting class, you know, show, show that you can recruit at this level, bringing in, you know, a, you know, a top 25, top 30 class, like we saw the last few years, because we have seen that it is attainable at Michigan state uh, on a consistent basis. So bringing that in, uh, you know, utilizing the transfer portal efficiently. I think, I think yeah. that's where, where we went wrong, the, you know, where MSU went wrong the last two years is using the transfer portal efficiently because you can't just bring in, you know, 20 guys and expect them all to kind of buy into the culture and buy into what's going on. I think it's got to be, you know, is it worth having, you know, three, four open scholarships and not getting, you know, three, three guys out of the portal that could, you know, potentially hurt the culture of the program as opposed to making sure that you have all 85 roster spots filled out. So I think, you know, figuring out that um, and kind of who's going to stay and who's going to leave after this season. And then, yeah, by year three, I think there should be an expectation to, you know, be a team like Michigan kind of be between the eight to 10 wins range kind of, and then, you know, find a way to make uh, the 12-team playoff in year four. I think, you know, it could be attainable year three, but I, I, I wouldn't set that expectation quite yet. Uh, I think we'll, we'll have an idea. But I do want to say, because uh, I do see a lot of comments on it, I know I've had some conversations the past, you know, couple of days about the schedule, you know, moving ahead. A lot of people are saying there's eight wins on this schedule. and while, while I think there are eight winnable games, I also do think, you know, if they if they fall short of eight wins, but they still get six wins, I think that's perfectly fine. But on the yeah. flip side of that coin, you know, if there is eight, if MSU does win eight games, or let's say, you know, let's say they knock off, you know, one of those, you know, top 25 teams of Michigan, Ohio State, Oregon that they play and they win nine games, I don't think that resets expectations because I think that's what hurt Michigan State uh, under Mel Tucker is they go out and they win 11 games and it, it kind of, you know, hurt the expectations the next couple of years because it still was a, a big rebuild. And I think, you know, Michigan State, you know, if they go out and win nine games under Smith next year, there still is, a, there's still going to be a rebuild. And I think year two, you could see a regression, but again, it's it's kind of staying consistent on that, you know, traje trajectory and you know, moving forward. No, I completely agree. I do think there are some pieces to build on uh, in East Lansing right now. You talk about a Jordan Hall, you talk about Chance Rucker, who has a you know, both of those guys, true freshmen, got a ton of experience this year. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about that secondary that that Michigan State has with uh, with Dylan Tatum and Jaden Mangum and Malik Spencer. Those are some guys you can build around. Um, I think there are some pieces here. We've, we've talked about the quarterbacks a little bit. And, you know, Jonathan Smith being a quarterback, a former quarterback and a quarterback guy, um, that's one of the things I'm curious about is, is what does that look like for, for these young guys to have a, a head coach who not only played the position, um, but – uh, he knows what it's like. He knows he, he's going to, I think he's going to be very beneficial to, to a Sam leave it and a, and a Kate Hauser. Um, and I, this, this is just purely gut feeling. Um, I know there's some talk about, uh, a, a younger Oregon state quarterback who, who might, tr might transfer to Michigan state and, and join Smith and East Lansing. Um, do you have the name of that kid? I don't remember. Yeah. His name. Aiden, Aiden Childs is his name. Aiden Childs. Aiden so, Childs, yeah. he's a former four-star kid, I believe. Yeah, yeah, he is a top uh, hundred prospect, uh, lead eleven quarterback. 
one of one of the highest ranked recruits. I think he was number six all time for Oregon State um, okay. in rankings. He was ranked ahead of Sam Levitt last year in you know in the quarterback rankings. So you know he he's seen some time. He was the he was their backup this year. Uh, so just yeah, kind of seeing that, and you you can see there's arm talent with that kid, and that you know he he can be. A, a good quarterback moving forward. Again, he's he's kind of he's a younger guy right now, so you're going to be working with a lot of younger guys with you know Hauser Levitt, and it, if you get Childs, I would probably assume one of them leave. But either way, you're still going to be working with a young quarterback group. Yeah, no. Anytime, anytime you have a coaching change, uh, you're going to have a quarterback competition. There's no, there's no doubt, unless you've got, you know, some like. It, uh, unless you got like an Andrew Luck or somebody like that on your mm-hmm. roster from, you know, from his Stanford days, like you're, you're going to have a quarterback competition. I think that's okay though. Like let these guys, mm-hmm. you know, throw the balls out and again, new, new set of eyes, uh, new evaluation techniques and, and, and let them figure it out. Um, who, who's a best behind center, um, going forward under this new regime. So, um, but something to be excited about there for sure. Uh, a couple other things from the comments section. Um, uh, you can go ahead and talk about this, Aiden, since you did write an article uh, about this. Uh, we haven't published it on our website yet, but uh, David asked about you know potential Oregon State players. You mentioned uh, the Childs uh, kid, so he's certainly one mm-hmm. of those. Um, but what other what other guys from Oregon State could potentially you know hit the transfer portal and, and hop over to to East Lansing? Guys who can make uh, an early impact. Yeah, Child Childs is definitely kind of top of that list. I think. A lot of Oregon State, kind of what they banked on in, in you know, the years under Smith where, where they were successful is the development of players. So if you, right. you know, if they go out and bring in, you know, guys from Oregon State that you've never heard of that are, you know, you go check their recruiting rankings and it's, you know, three star kind of guys, they, they're they very keen on development, which has helped them, uh, you know, getting these under recruited players has helped them kind of retain them in a way too. So they don't immediately hit the transfer portal because they're a four-star recruit. So, you know, there's, there's the development of that. I also added uh, one of their tight end. I think his name is Chris Velling. I know the last name for sure is, is Velling. So, you know, they're, you know, Wozniak, their, their tight ends coach just developed a, a second round draft pick last year. Um, so, you know, He's he's a sophomore coming in that could establish, you know, some stability there in the tight end, you know, room that, you know, they have a lot of guys. But, you know, finding that one guy or kind of finding another guy outside of Malik Carr to compliment him or offer some stability, I think that's that's huge. I think, um, you know, I know the the running back Damian Martinez is up for the, the Dope Walker Award. He's a he's a finalist, I believe. Um, I know their linebacker, uh, I can't remember his, his last name. It's hyphenated. It's like Arnold is, is Arnold's his second, uh, last name. So though, you know, those guys are going to be all conference players, but kind of, they have to evaluate whether or not they want to go pro or come back to either, you know, college or go back to Oregon state for another year. So. I think there's a lot of talent on that team, but it, it's going to be developed. So if you get these transfer players that are no name guys that you never heard of, um, you know, don't don't act surprised because that that's kind of what they've done so far is just, you know, they're really keen on development. Yeah, no, I like what you said about the transfer portal and, and being efficient in the transfer portal. It did seem like um, obviously uh, Tucker hit a grand slam on. Uh, on Kenneth Walker, and there there were a couple other guys who were certainly uh, big contributors. Um, Jaden Breed being one of those, like huge huge contributor. Um, Aaron Brule, I thought played very well this this season. Um, he was a transfer portal guy. I came from uh, was it Mississippi State, I believe. Yeah, Mississippi uh, State. So you know they're, they they they've they've had some um, some hits in the transfer portal, but then you have other situations where. Um, uh, speaking to like Tunmis Adadele, who was a, a, a really highly rated high school kid, he goes to Texas A&M, um, doesn't really crack the rotation. Um, I didn't I, certainly we didn't mind Michigan State taking a flyer out on that kid, but there's mm-hmm. there's something to be said that maybe maybe you avoid the the big name uh, former 
a high rated prospects who, who didn't work at those first, uh, or maybe just bet, bet guys a little bit better. Um, and I'm not saying anything specifically about ton I'm just saying like he was an example of, of one of those types of guys. Um, you had some other, uh, you had some other guys in the, in the portal who, you thought would be contributors. I'm thinking Jarrett Jackson and, and Dre Butler, you know, two, two defensive tackles and, and they were hurt for the majority of the season. And that's just unfortunate. It didn't, it didn't pan out the way that uh, anybody thought it would. Uh, Jalen Sammy was another one, uh, another guy, you know, big kid from, from Colorado uh, didn't really pan out. So I, I liked what you said there about, you know, you, you got to vet the transfer portal well and, mm-hmm. um, and, and, the transfer portal should be a supplement to your roster. It should not be the way you right. build uh, the roster. Um, that's got like high school recruiting still has to be the way, the way you go about it. Um, speaking to the, I should have mentioned this earlier when you were talking about um, there's some comments about uh, eight wins next season. Um, and I, again, there, there could be eight winnable games, but I think one of the, one of the primary, uh, I don't want to say problems, um, things that needs to be addressed is just the depth of this roster. We talked about how there are some high, high end talent, um, but the depth has something that th- you got to flesh the roster out a little bit more. Um, and that's something that is as good as, you know, Tucker and the previous staff was about bringing in some four star kids. Um, they, that, that next level of, of prospect, they had a hard time filling out the rest of their classes uh, when they didn't uh, hit on some of these um these high four stars or even some, some, some five star swings. Um, Jonathan Smith doesn't strike me as the kind of coach who is just going to, is going to just target these four stars across the country mm-hmm. and try to bring them to East Lansing. He doesn't strike me as that, uh, that approach at all. Um, so that'll be interesting to see what approach it is. And, and we'll get a, at least a glimpse of it fairly, fairly quickly here with, with signing day on the 20th. Um, yeah, I think with that, Aiden. Uh, oh, I did want to give a shout out to to Alan Haller, the athletic director. You mentioned him uh, towards the beginning of the pod. Um, mm-hmm. The just the buttoned up nature of this coaching surge. I think he deserves a lot of credit. There weren't many leaks. He mostly kept the board of trustees out of it, which was uh, a very wise decision given everything that's going on with the board of trustees mm-hmm. over these last you know several weeks. Um, and so I just wanted to give a little hat tip to, to Alan Haller. I thought he conducted a, a search, uh, the right way. Um, and very buttoned up, very, uh, very clean. Um, and also just to announce to you guys that, uh, Jonathan Smith's introductory press conference is going to be on Tuesday, uh, I think at noon. So, um, I'm going to be over in East Lansing, uh, for sure for that. And we'll have coverage of that on Tuesday. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, with that, Aiden, how about we get into some burning questions of our own here Mm -hmm. and, uh, we'll kind of wrap things up as we're approaching 50 minutes. Um, again, appreciate everybody for, for showing up. This is one of our most popular pods that we've done. So a lot of excitement, obviously, and and happy to see that. So let's uh, move into our burning questions segment. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess, I guess I can go first. So, you know, I'm guessing most of our burning questions are going to be about the hire. Uh, so yeah. my first question is what does Smith need to do to address NIL? The, uh, I, 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 I can just leave it at that. It's, it's pretty much that simple. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it's one that my buddy, Matt McCartney brought up too, uh, was, you know, we, we saw what happened with uh, the SD4L brand, uh, right before the Iowa game, uh, of this year where they kind of just up and decided, yeah, we're not going to support the, the majority of our of our football team anymore. Mm-hmm. So that is uh, that's challenging because, and I've seen this thrown out there. I think I think SD4L um, and Michigan State's approach to NIL needs a rebrand. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to start from scratch, um, but I think the name of SD4L has been really tainted by by what happened with um, the football team ahead of Iowa. There, there, a lot of trust was lost. I think uh, fan support, I'm sure, is is low uh, for that specific brand because uh, you just don't know. You, unpredictability, when you're asking people for donations and to support your programs, unpredictability is like the worst route you can take. And right. so the, there's a lot of a lot of problems there. So um, on the flip side of that, <clears throat> sorry, you have This Is Sparta, who is another NIL um, collective. Uh, not officially um, 
endorsed by the university, but they are, you know, very t uh, close with with the university, and they they help uh, of of majority of a variety of programs, not just football, not just men's basketball. They're also involved with um, some of the the non revenue sports. And they have a very good reputation. So maybe there's some kind of merging between uh, this is Sparta and SD4L and they come together and, and work that out. So, no, it's a great question and, and one of the highest priority things to get worked out going forward because NIL is a huge part of college athletics at this point. So great question. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess part of, part of the reason why I asked it first was, you know, the level of importance in this day and age of just college sports. Um, you know, NIL, I think that's a huge factor in our, you know, it's in recruiting. Um, it's just, in, it's, it's just in everything now. So figuring that out, I think, uh, yeah. So to answer Carrie Ellis, yeah, they did back out on, they, they kept some deals on, they kept deals on with the basketball program. Um, but they did back out on, on a lot of deals with football players. They still had, I want to say it was like between five to ten that were still sponsored so uh yeah so figuring that out i think a lot of people bring up the you know the big time donors the the dan gilberts the matt ishbia um kind of guys you know the fact that you know even magic johnson the fact that they own uh professional sports teams uh does not mean they can it means they can't really uh play directly into NIL, they can't, you know, you know, fully support NIL. They can invest some money, but not, uh, not directly have sponsor sponsorships with players. So, uh, figuring that out, I think the smaller donors are are going to be really important. I think that's what MSU has got to figure out uh, is the small don the donor pool that you know they aren't billionaires. They can't, you know, you know, pay for brand new facilities, but they can help, you know. That, that smaller sum of money that's still, you know, five or six figures goes a long way when you're, you know, when you're paying an athlete rather than, you know, helping build new facilities or, you know, getting a, a plaque in Spartan Stadium with your name on it. No, I, I completely agree uh, with, with you on that. Um, I'm going to throw out my first burning question because it actually pertains to this last football season and a little bit to Mel Tucker. And honestly, okay. uh, I'm, I'm so ready to just put that in the rear view mirror and, and not talk about it because it's been, it was a grind. Uh, the, the last mm -hmm. 10 weeks of the season uh, after that news broke, it, it was a grind and um, it was a long, long couple of months. So let's just throw that out. Um, I'm going to skip right to my second one. Um, it does pertain a little bit to to the Mel Tucker situation, um, but I'll, I'll just throw it at you. So um, let's I'm going to throw a hypothet hypothetical at you. Let's say the um, the situation that cost Mel Tucker his job. Uh, let's say that never happened. Let's say that's that whole thing. It was let's, let's erase yeah. that part of history and say uh, Mel Tucker is still the head coach going into 2024 um, based on, uh, you know, just what we what we've seen from the last couple of years. Do you think Michigan State's in a better spot now um, with with a guy who in Jonathan Smith, who has had some success recently, but he doesn't have the Midwest ties? I think is Michigan State in a better spot now than they would have been under Mel Tucker going forward. Uh, even without the the whole uh, sexual assault uh, or sexual harassment, sorry, not assault, uh, harassment allegations, um, where are you at with that? Yeah, uh, that that's a good question. I think that's that's really tough. Uh, you know, because you you would assume that you know those recruits would still you know the the few recruits that still stayed on, you would assume that they would you know keep them, and then that would they would add to this you know, current class that was struggling before he even got fired. Uh, so you, you would hope that's the case, but I do think that Michigan State, you know, next year may not be in a better spot. Uh, but I do think, you know, two years from now, I think we'll look back at it and say, okay, you know, this, this might have been, you know, a blessing in disguise that MSU, uh, you know, in year two under Smith may be kind of, on a better path or a better trajectory, uh, depending, depending on what he does, you know, next season, uh, compared to Mel Tucker, because it does seem like, uh, they, you know, Tucker's staff was really dependent on, you know, the athletes they got, they, you know, 
their scheme kind of seemed to fit that, you know, if you were getting those top, you know, tier recruits, we see, we see it with the, the big time recruits that they have or that they got. We saw it with, you know, Jordan Hall that, you know, when you add that talent to the scheme they're running, he's going to be successful. But when you don't have that, you know, when you don't have that talent at every position yet, uh, you know, the scheme doesn't work. So right. I think X's and O's wise, I think they are in a better place. I think they are going to win more games, uh, you know, maybe not next year, but two years from now than, than what Mel Tucker may have done at MSU. Yeah, no, I agree. And the reason why I asked that question is this. Um, personal opinion, I think if if the Mel Tucker thing doesn't happen uh, back in September, um, I think Michigan State probably wins a couple more games uh, this fall, maybe gets to that six and six mark. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe even that seven and five mark and they're going to a bowl game um, right now. Um, but I think there were some foundational issues with the Mel Tucker regime uh, when it comes to the, the approach to recruiting, when it comes to uh, retaining the coaching staff after uh, a bad season last year where, you know, you, you keep on Jay Johnson, you keep on Scotty Hazleton, um, you keep on a Ross Ells in, in that, that special teams coordinator spot. That, that was a red flag to me as this season progressed. I was you know, just thinking about this question, like, man, if he was still here, um, it's a red flag. So, I think by by wiping the slate clean, I think I agree with you about next year. You know, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and and next September, and we'll see how that whole thing plays out. Uh, but no, I I completely agree that uh, I think Michigan State is going to be in a better spot uh, going forward. Would you, if you look at like the next uh, like just a three year projection, um, I think the three-year projection under Jonathan Smith, I like better than the, the three-year projection under, under uh, Mel Tucker. The other part of it was because of Mel Tucker's contract. And uh, w- w- if, if you couldn't get uh, fire him for cause, which obviously they, they ended up doing, you're kind of tied to him because of all the money that you you're, you're giving to him. Um, so that's why I think they're in a better spot now because you don't have that, that uh, contract that's weighing, that's weighing you down. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility, and we'll and we'll see what they ultimately end up uh, paying um, paying Jonathan Smith going forward. Uh, but that's why I thought they were in a better spot. I think we lost the feed on Aiden, um, so as uh, we we kind of wait for him to come back into our feed, I'll continue with my uh, my next burning question. And um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so my next burning question was, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, what's your approval rating of, of Alan Haller's hire? Uh, Aiden's back here. So we thought we might have gotten the – the the uh, every podcast uh, we see Aiden or or myself uh, during the show. Um, and we had one of those glitches right before we went live, so we thought – we hoped that that was the, the one occurrence tonight, but uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't the case. But my second uh, burning question – I kind of jumped you in line here, Aiden. That's but, fine. Uh, my second one – was on a scale of one to 10, what's your approval rating of Alan Haller's hire uh, of Jonathan Smith? Like uh, it's, we talked about the field that was out there. Um, just give me a scale of one to 10. Give me a number that uh, speaks to where you're at with this hire. Yeah, I think at this current this current time, uh, I would say it's at an eight. I think he did well with, you know, the, the options that he had. Um, you know, it was it was pretty simple that it was down to him or Elko on the last couple days. Uh, you know, they did do some other interviews with Jason Candle, Jed Fish, um, you know, Lance Leipold. So kind of figuring that out. But I do think it's at an eight. Uh, just the way the way they executed that. I think, you know, obviously, you know, we've heard all this stuff about Urban Meyer uh you know that wasn't gonna happen and you know i think they did the best they could with you know the resources they they put together and i think that's you know commendable and yeah you know he's not the biggest name in college football right now but he is a well-known name amongst you know coaching circles and people who do follow college football closely know the you know that the job he he's done at oregon state is he took them from being you know, worse than Rutgers, worse than Vanderbilt to 
now, you know, a top 25 team and a team that, you know, competed until the end uh, against Washington last week. And, you know, you'd think that if the rumors weren't, you know, swirling around that, that, that Oregon, Oregon State game, you know, on Friday would be a lot closer than it was. Right. No, I think uh, the back to back having to play Washington and then go on the road to Eugene and play Oregon, that was brutal. Um, and so I, I wasn't surprised by what we saw on the field on Friday uh, from Oregon State and Oregon. Um, I'm with you as well. I, I, I had this as an eight. Um, I think it's a very good hire um, for for Alan Haller and the university. Um, obviously, yeah, there, the, the Urban Meyer thing was out there. And from a purely from a football standpoint, yeah, that would have been, you know, the, the biggest hire you could have made. Um, I don't think it's it's fair to Jonathan Smith to judge him based on some speculation that Urban Meyer was potentially a candidate. So I'm, I'm hoping and, and I will give credit to um, a large portion of the fan base uh, since this this uh, hire was announced. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of. Um, for lack of a better term, belly aching about the the Urban Meyer thing post uh, the hire being announced, um, and that's encouraging to me. I think I think that's a good response for for the fan base. And yeah, I'm with you. I, I think it, it's a solid eight for me as well. Mm-hmm. All right, go ahead and hit me with another uh, of your burning questions. We'll probably do uh, two uh, from you back to back as well here. All right. So my sec or yeah, I guess my second burning question. Second one, yeah. Um. So I guess. Give me two guys on the on this Michigan State roster, one on offense, one on defense, that is the top priority for, uh, you know, Jonathan Smith and his staff moving forward. Uh, to retain, you're saying? Yeah, to yeah to retain and make sure they don't leave. Okay, um, there's a there's a there's a few guys on defense. I, th- I actually think there's there's quite a few, but the the top guy has to be Jordan Hall. Um, mm-hmm. He's a guy who, from the day he got there on campus, was talked. His leadership skills were talked about. Um, he's a guy who did not look like a true freshman, um, did not play like a true freshman. Uh, so there's no doubt uh, in my mind that uh, that the top guy is is Jordan Hall on defense. Offensively is a little bit um, tougher uh, just because, you know, we've talked about the quarterbacks, um, but we've also talked about uh, uh, the child's kid from from Oregon State who potentially could come over. So how how much of a priority is that? Um this is a guy who I don't think is going anywhere, but I'm going to list him as my priority anyway. And that's Nathan Carter. Um, mm-hmm. Just because I think, and, and even in, he only carried the ball eight times against Penn state. Um, but you, you st- we still saw a little bit of that wiggle. Um, his, his explosiveness when he gets the ball in his hands, he's, he's quick twitch. Um, I really do think that Nathan Carter can be an impact player at Michigan state. Um given a, a, a better offensive line, um, a more cohesive offensive line, a better uh, scheme as far as approach to to play calling and things like that. I do think he um, is is um, a plus talent, I guess, at, at running back. Mm-hmm. He's not an average player. I think he's an above average player, um, to potentially a very good player uh, even here. So that would be my answer. I don't know. Um, again, I don't think he's going to go anywhere. So there's a little bit of caveat, I guess, with my answer, but that's who I would go with. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give two different, two different names sure. because I do, I do think that those were probably the two, those were the two that I had in mind. Okay. Um, as, as my choices, but I can go with two different names. I'll say uh, for offense, I, it, it's tricky outside of Nathan Carter because you do talk about the running back uh, or sorry, the quarterback battle um, between Hauser and, you know, Levitt and the potential of getting Childs, who is a good, you know, young quarterback, but he's in Levitt's class. So, you know, Levitt want to come in and compete right away. And if, you know, Smith is bringing his own guy, it's kind of safe to assume that, you know, you know, he's going to start. Uh, so there, there's that aspect. Um, so I think I, I'll go with Malik Carr, I think, on offense. I think okay. that's uh, a player, you know, I did talk about the, the Velling, you know, you know, tight end who's, who's a sophomore right now at Oregon state. I think Malik Carr is a, a player that they need to retain on offense. Um, you know, outside of Nathan Carter, because I do think there needs to be some weapons. I think, uh, for him, it's just getting him to play consistently. I think, you know, we've, we've all seen the talent that's there. Um, you know, he could be, 
uh, an NFL type player, but he's got he's got a ways to go. Um, and I think, you know, the proper development could help him get to where where he wants to go and where people think he can go. Um, and then defensively, I, you know, I would I would say the number two priority out of Jor- besides Jordan Hall um, kind of switches back and forth between Malik Spencer and Chance Rucker. I think I, I think I'll I'll say Malik Spencer for now. Okay. Because I do think players like I think a Jaden Mangum and a Dylan Tatum will both stay and not not hit the transfer portal um, just yet. Uh, I th- yeah, I think they're they're you know Michigan State, you know they're Michigan natives. I think they they would in, they'll enjoy or they enjoy playing at MSU. So I think Malik Spencer because he's a Georgia player because he had a good season. Um, you know, he didn't make all the plays, but you you could tell he impacted the the game a lot um, in various different places. He could play linebacker. He can play on a nickel back. He can play safety. So his versatility is really important and making sure that another program doesn't come in and, you know, grab him because he, he could be a value, valuable piece for Michigan State moving forward and next year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you if you want to say I'll go back to back uh, so I can go with my my third question then. Yeah, real, real um, quick before you do that, though, uh, right. I thought Dan, Dan brings up a good point here that, you know, Nathan Carter did use his one time transfer uh, when he mm-hmm. came over from UConn. Um, so, again, as we as we noted, uh, don't think their Michigan State is in much uh, danger of losing Nathan Carter, but just uh, we're speaking to the importance of, of him as, as a player go, uh, going forward. But a good point by, by Dan mm-hmm. in the comment section. So, all right, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so my next question is, what is Smith, you know, how is he going to fill out the rest of that 2023 class? Who is who does he need to kind of prioritize? I know we heard about uh, once he gets the, the rest of his staff on uh, on campus that, you know, their first, you know, their first few meetings are going to be with, you know, A.J. Dennis and Nick Marsh. So who, who else or, you know, those two can be your answer, but who else should they prioritize in this class? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, just because uh, you would, th- it's it's interesting because he's he's coming from the West Coast and coming from Oregon. That's such a it's such a different uh, recruiting footprint. Um, and so, in, in a lot of case, or in in a lot of normal cases, um, you would kind of expect a a coach to to bring a a, a chunk of the recruiting class that he had at his previous spot over. Uh, especially that first class, because as we know, with with a reduced timeline, it's so hard to to put a class together in, in three weeks. And so, if you can take some of those uh, kids from your uh, previous recruiting class, then and then that helps uh, alleviate some of that um, that first class being a bit of a typically it's a it's a lower uh, ranked class. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do wonder with with such a distance, if how many of those kids from Oregon State's class would be willing to come all the way to Michigan? I just that's a question that I have. Um, but to, to answer your questions, I think, um, one of the first prospects I would call outside of a, a Nick Marsh, we talked to, uh, talked about earlier, but one of the first ones I'd call would be, uh, AJ Dennis, Andrew Dennis, um, mm-hmm. who was a kid who, uh, committed to Chris Kapilovich. He's from, uh, Mount Pleasant, I believe. And mm-hmm. so, uh, he's from the area. He was a kid who was initially underrated as a prospect, um, but but moved up the rankings very uh, leaped up the rankings over the last couple of months and uh, was considered like a borderline four star um, at this point. Um, I know he's gotten offers from Penn State uh, and and various other places, uh, but even before he decommitted from Michigan State. But that's a kid who previously showed a lot of interest in Michigan State enough to commit. Now, it was to a a different offensive line coach. But he would be a guy who I would reach out to offensively. Um, defensively, I don't hold out a whole lot of hope uh, in, in for, for this kid because he has committed now to Oklahoma. But uh, Reggie mm-hmm. Powers, the, the safety yeah. out of Ohio, would be my, my defensive answer, I guess, to this question as well. Um, again, I think it's a tough pull at this point, three weeks before uh, signing day, when you have um, a coach who – probably has had uh, a head coach who has had no interaction probably with Reggie Powers just because again, Midwest kid um, committed to Oklahoma who had a very uh, solid season under Brent Venables this, uh, this last year. 
and and they're going to go to a, a pretty good bowl game going forward. So a, a tough poll, but he would be my my second answer. Yeah, that I mean that's a good answer. I didn't even really think about Reggie Powers. So yeah, I I, I totally agree with that. I think yeah, AJ Dennis has to you know has to be one of the top priorities. I think you know we we talked about the importance of Courtney Hawkins with Nick Marsh. So having that as well. Uh, just retaining all the guys that are still committed. I think that that's important. And yeah, filling, filling out that class. I think, um, you know, we have seen some guys from California come to MSU the last couple of years. So, you know, the fact that Smith does recruit Southern California and he does, he does a pretty good job with that. I know Childs is from Southern California. So, you know, maybe the maybe the Southern California players that he has committed at Oregon State, maybe flipping some of those. I know Jason Brown, a, a running back that we talked about uh, the yeah. past few. You know, you know, this is this is a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, but we we talked about him kind of being with Anthony Carey, but now that Anthony Carey has decommitted from MSU, he would be the lone running back prospect in this class, and he's a, another top 100 player in the country. So that that would be huge uh, to to go and get someone like him because he is familiar with MSU in terms of the, the landscape uh, of the program, but you know with a, a new face in charge. So I think that's that's a priority for, for MSU moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely. Um, and again, very going to be very interesting to see what these next three weeks look like yeah. um, with recruiting and, and that first uh, signing day. Um, there is that the second signing period in, in February, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see the majority um, or at least I want, maybe not majority, but uh, a good chunk of the of this year's recruiting class, I think, will probably sign in that second period just because it gives mm -hmm. uh, the staff some more some more time uh, to to recruit and, and familiarize with with high school coaches, with with uh, some of the local talent and things like that. So, yeah, that'll be a high on the priority list going forward. Um, this next question, since we're uh, we're getting up there in, in our time here, but uh, audience retention has been pretty good so far, so we appreciate that uh, from you guys. Um, but we can we can kind of hit this one very quickly. It's it's more of a fun natured one. Uh, but my question is, uh, did Michigan State intentionally plan to announce its head coaching hire during the game? Uh, because it was, uh, I think, in the first quarter, and uh, Twitter's a buzz about um, uh, Jonathan Smith heading to to Michigan State. So, you think that do you, was that coordinated? Was that planned, Aiden? I think it was in a way because all the the news at halftime, or a lot of the news at you know halftime of all those games was that Jonathan Smith was you know the hire for michigan state so i do think that was planned i think i think it was a, a you know a smart little thing to do for for msu so yeah no i completely agree i think it was absolutely a part of the mm -hmm. plan um it's funny like right before michigan state played penn state uh, we had that uh on nbc there was the report about how uh haller was zeroing zeroing in on um on Jonathan Smith as his guy and so I wrote a I wrote an article as you know the first half is playing out of that game and got that out there um and uh, they said on the broadcast that this could be uh, wrapped up as as quickly as this weekend and I was like oh yeah okay yeah that makes sense uh, I was thinking Monday uh yeah me too would be the day and then um, I'm sitting down I'm, I'm watching the game and boom there's the news and I was like whoa that happened really quickly but the more I thought about it I absolutely think it was coordinated and planned that way um by by Alan Haller uh and I do I agree with you I think it was a smart little way of of um just grabbing some of that attention uh to to East Lansing and and I think it was effective in in that way so uh yeah a nice little um PR move by by Alan Haller and uh and his department over there at, at Michigan State um so do you have two more uh Brittany yep. questions Aiden okay go ahead and hit, hit me with one of yours and then we'll uh, get into a little bit of basketball all right so my last football question is is there a name that you have in mind for Michigan State or I guess for Jonathan Smith to, you know, an assistant coach to make a hire that's not from the Oregon State staff? OK. Or is there a guy that you you're looking at that you're like, hey, I would I would want Smith to kind of go get him. 
Yeah, no. So I'm I'm actually going to steal this one from the comment section because I saw it a little earlier. Uh, and then I have one that's like w way out in left field, but I'm going to throw it out there. But okay. um, I, I might anger some people with it, but I'm going to throw it out and just get just kind of get a read on it. OK, but mm -hmm. the, the one I'm going to steal from the uh, the comment section would be um, Jim Leonard, uh, the former defensive coordinator at Wisconsin. Um, I'm not I can't remember exactly where he's at now, but he he's was at Illinois. Who, He's at Illinois. I would give him yeah. a call. He's an analyst there, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so I would absolutely give Jim Leonard a call. Uh, I think m melding the the offensive philosophy of a Jonathan Smith and these offensive coaches he's brought over uh, with a guy who has proven to be very good in the Big Ten uh, or put together good Big Ten defenses and a Jim Leonard, he would be one of the first guys I would call um, for, for defensive coordinator. Um, but I do, I guess the the – the pushback or not really pushback, but the it's, I think it'd be an uphill battle just because Jim Leonard seemed like he was ready to, to take on a head coaching job. And I know that he um, interviewed and was um, he wanted to get the, the Wisconsin job before they hired Luke fickle. Um, so I, I guess and I'm not sure where his mindset is at right now, if he's willing to take on another coordinator role or if he uh, believes himself ready to be a head coach. Um, but again, it's been, it's been a year now um, there where he's been the analyst and he hasn't been one of those on-field coaches. So maybe he would be willing to, uh, to take on that coordinator role. And maybe it's a, a two year showcase for, for him going forward. It's a, it's a short term thing, but I think that would be um, a really big, uh, a, a huge hire for, for Jonathan Smith. And I think that would gain a lot of uh, the, I think his approval rating would, would skyrocket if he was able to pull that off. Um, the name that I wanted to just throw out there and get a feel for, and this is crazy, like I admit that completely, um, but uh, Indiana did just fire Tom Allen, and he was a defensive coordinator at Indiana under Brian Wilson, uh, Kevin Wilson, Kevin Wilson, before he got that head coaching job. Um, do you do you put any feelers out for for Tom Allen just because he's a defensive guy, or is that just crazy? Um. I mean, I guess it's not crazy in the sense that he does, you know, he was a defensive coordinator and it was a defensive coach. I think, uh, is he willing to be a coordinator? I think that that's yeah, the that's question because question. he does, you know, have, you know, almost, you know, a little over a deck or half a decade for, of, you know, head coaching experience. Um, that, is he willing to go back in an assistant role? Uh, I think that was another question. Uh, you know, people, people talked about Dan Mullen in that way, uh, for, yeah. you know, various offensive coordinator roles and people, you know, everyone just asked the question is, you know, is he, you know, a CEO type guy or is he willing to go back and be kind of, kind of one of the assistants? So I, I think that's, yeah, that's a, that's a, that, that would be my answer. Yeah, certainly it's out in left field. Um, Rich P, I wanted to address your comment. I agree. I think it is it is out of left field, um, and I'm not I'm not advocating for this. I'm just throwing it out there because um, I did think when he was the the defensive coordinator um, at Indiana, I thought he did a good job. But to your point, he's been a head coach now for a few years. Would he be mm -hmm. willing to take um, that step back down? Um, also, he just got a $20 million uh, buyout, so he can probably, you know, go kick it in uh, the Bahamas somewhere for, for a year and, and enjoy, enjoy that, uh, that buyout that he's got. So um, again, not saying it was a good idea. It's just one of those that was out there who he's, he's been around football for a long time. He knows the area. Uh, so, so maybe, um, but again, not advocating for it. So, all right. Um, go ahead. Oh, you, uh, you answer your own burning. Oh question. yeah. Um, my answer would be the, the defensive coordinator from, from Toledo, Vince Kurz. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think that's a name that's been thrown around a lot for, for people. Uh, I think that would be a good defensive coordinator hire. Uh, he has Ohio kind of Michigan, roots or he's familiar with the area because he's been at Toledo their their defense has been really good they finished 11 and won this season um you know headed to a Mac championship again uh so I think yeah that's that's a potential hire for defensive coordinator if Trent Bray does not come to MSU Right, and and bringing a guy who who has those Ohio ties again, we we've, we've mm. talked about this. Uh, I think Ohio 
is uh, such a keystone state for for this program and, and something that they need to uh, reestablish those roots. Um, and then again, to your point, you got to get into Detroit a little bit. You got to get into Chicago a little bit. Um, there's enough talent in the Midwest uh, region to uh, to quickly move up um, the uh, the tiers of the Big Ten or, or move up to the Big Ten standings. Like there's there's um, there's there's pipelines to be had for sure. Uh, in this in this area, uh, keys to wisdom. Now, Narduzzi is a name who I definitely would think would have too big of an ego to to take a DC job. I, I think that guy, again, he did a lot of great things here, and he should uh, be remembered fondly for uh, the no fly zone and things like that. But I do think um, he would have a hard time uh, taking on a DC uh, a job at this point. I don't I don't know if the the personality mix with between Smith and and Marduzzi would just seems weird and, and off yeah. to me as well. But no, yeah. I know you were I know you were being uh, facetious there, uh, accused of wisdom. But I just wanted to throw that out there. So, um, let's see. I think uh, last my question. last my yeah. last question is is basketball. So um, yep. if we if we're gonna lose any of our audience, we're gonna briefly touch on basketball here and then call it a night. Um, but I did want to say, uh, really do appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. And um, just the, the retention that we've had, this is, I think, the largest audience we've had for, for one of our shows. Um, so just really encouraged by that. And, and thank you guys for tuning in um, and hope you uh, hope we brought you uh, a lot of information um, and enjoyed the, the interactions with the comment section as well. So with that, we'll get into a little bit of basketball here and, and, and then we'll call it a night. Um, OK, Aiden, my last burning question. Uh, how disappointing is Michigan State's three and three start to the season? And then, kind of as a follow up, uh, how how worried are you um, about this start uh, to to the year with with all of the um, expectations that uh, were kind of put on this team uh, coming into it? Yeah, I think it I think it's a little concerning. I know the the Arizona game. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you watched that. Uh, you know, first half really struggled uh not you know not not the not the same msu team we saw in the second half msu came out in the second half strong took the lead in the end and then you know lost the lead late in the game uh it seemed it seemed very similar to the rest of their losses this you know the other the duke and the james madison lost this season where it was a tale of two halves uh msu struggled uh at times you know the the scoring droughts the the turnovers have been, you know, an issue for MSU for as long as I can remember. And that really needs to be addressed. And the the talent seems to be kind of lacking in some places. Uh, they're, they're still trying to figure out that, that front court issue. And they're really just figuring out who, um, you know, mixes and molds well in, in the front, in the, in the back court with the guards. So just figuring out that rotation, um, if I had to put, you know, if I had to put it on a scale of one to 10, say my concern is around a seven right now, uh, okay. you know, figuring that out and then kind of moving forward. I think the Baylor game is, you know, that's the big one that everyone's marked kind of, uh, yeah, moving forward, you know, win the rest of the games in between and then, you know, win winning that Baylor game, I think that would lower, uh, you know, my, my, anxiety or kind of how how uh you know scared i am for msu to uh you know moving forward but that that's kind of where i'm at yeah no so i i have i have two different answers for the two halves of my question um mm -hmm. how disappointing is the three and three start i think it's very disappointing yeah. um honestly i think uh, with with games against Arizona and Duke, uh, talking about from a preseason perspective going into the year, if you would have told me that this team was going to start four and two, um, I would have thought that would be a little bit disappointing because that means you're you're probably losing to Duke, you're probably losing to Arizona, and then you beat these other teams um, who aren't as high profile. So you throw in the the loss to James Madison as well, and I think it's fair to say it, it very disappointed in, in the three and three start. Um, as far as my worry level. Um, I'm not hitting the panic button yet. And I did a seven out of 10 is not the panic button either, but I'm at about six. I would say like, mm. I do think there is some talent here or, or the, there's a lot of talent here. Like, let me, let me back up. Like there's a ton of talent here. Um, 
I think what we saw in the second half against Arizona uh, was was encouraging. Um, I think again, if if you can get that team for uh, for forty minutes as opposed to twenty minutes, right? You're you've got you've got your Final Four contender. Like it's it's there for sure. So I do think uh, I do think there's the potential. There's still all the potential to to reach the goals that uh, that were laid out before the season, but we got to have better consistency, particularly out of AJ Hogard, um, mm-hmm. for sure. And then um, Jaden Akins was 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 better in the second half. AJ was too in the against Arizona, but those guys need to be uh, consistent because you know Tyson Walker can't can't carry the the scoring load uh, night in and night out, um, and and he needs some more consistent help there. Um, I think uh, certainly encouraged by Cohen Carr and, and Jeremy Fears, I think it looks really good. Um, so, yeah, so my, my, my worry level is about a, at a six at this point, uh, five and a half, six. Um, but as far as disappointment, I think it's fair to say uh, very disappointed so far in the start. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my, my last question kind of pertains to AJ Hogard. So okay. kind of, you know, he he did play well against Arizona, but, uh, you know, the whole product, the, you know, the total product from the last six games have not been the most promising. So is it, you know, is it worth starting uh, one of Fears or Holloman over Hogard until he kind of uh, gets better, gets on a more consistent basis? And it, if it if he should be benched, who which of uh, Fears and Holloman should start over him? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's funny, like <clears throat> the, the basketball game was on Thanksgiving day and as, as cool as that was, uh, it also was a little bit of a bummer for me cause I had to work uh, on Thanksgiving day. Yeah. Uh, and I was at my sister's and, and, you know, good, you know, family, great family time with all of them, but, you know, had to take a, some, some, a few hours away to, to do a little work. But one of my, um, the thing that I do for like my immediate takeaway from, from basketball is I do five observations. That's the first article that I write. Um, uh, as soon as the, I'm writing it during the game and I, I post it as soon as the game's done. Um, after that first half, I started writing my observations and one of my observations was AJ Hogard needs to be benched. And, uh, I couldn't like uh, the fact that he's a senior and all of that. And, and Jeremy fears is a freshman, mm-hmm. um, just didn't expect, just didn't expect AJ to struggle as much as he has through these first six games. Um, mm-hmm. I ended up changing that observation observation and, and deleting it and, and kind of reworking it a little bit uh, because I did think AJ played much better in the second half. Um, he still had uh, a questionable, uh, some questionable shot selection down the stretch in that game uh, though. So, you know, there's some of that, but um, I don't think it's time yet to, to bench AJ. Um, but man, like, the, the leash has to, and I will say, like Izzo has had a shorter leash on him um, these last few games, where he doesn't wait very long until, it, and he'll throw fears in there. And I think Jeremy has looked increasingly more comfortable as the season has gone on, even though we're only six games in. I thought he played pretty well against Arizona, all things considered. So, uh, to answer your question, fears would be my answer. Uh, I do like Holloman, but I like him more in that spot role where you you kind of throw him in there, you let him. Uh, just be really intense on defense. His on-ball defense is is very intense, and he and he gets in people's grills, and I like that a lot. Um, he showed that he can knock down the three um, a couple of games ago against uh, Alcorn State. Again, it was Alcorn State, but still, like they need they need shooters, and so I do like Holloman a lot, but I like him as as a as a spot uh, minutes type of guy. So my answer would be Fierce. Yeah, I think my answer right now would I think I I would say Holloman. I think Holloman. Okay blends well with you know walker and akins uh i think akins is, has struggled a little bit too i think maybe finding him a role to get him the ball to create more uh would also be another option that i didn't really that i didn't really pose but yeah um i know they've really worked between kind of is the three guard you know the three guard set is that you know the the most effective or should we go or should they go kind of with a, a car Malik Hall and then a center type type rotation but yeah like like you were saying I do think the freshmen um the three that have been playing have done well and you can see there's improvement from game to game and Fierce has you know really improved uh 
you know, I have I have no opposition if he if he's a starter. I think AJ Hogard did talk about like if I'm playing, he did tell Izzo yeah. that if I'm playing this bad, you can you can bench me. Um, so yeah, uh, I know I know there's a question about Booker. I know I think um, I was somewhat impressed in the I was impressed with the the minutes he was getting in the minutes he was getting the first few games, and then you watch the Arizona game and. He's nowhere to be found. Uh, he right. didn't play it pretty much at all. Uh, so yeah, figuring out the rotation. I know this is you know the classic Izzo. You know, have you know ten playable guys, and then you know once you hit January, it's about seven or maybe eight kind of players. But I do I do want to see more out of all the freshmen. Um, but I guess to answer my own question, I would I would go with Hallman over over Hogard until Hogard kind of you know, gets back in a groove somewhat um, and figures figures out what's kind of going wrong there. Sure. Um, Wesley, though, this is a good point. Maybe that's maybe that would be the wake up call that AJ needs. Um, interestingly, mm-hmm. uh, Michigan State plays Georgia Southern on on Tuesday. I don't think Georgia Southern has won a game, or at least the last time I checked, they hadn't won a game yet this season. So that, obviously that's an opportunity to, for for a get right game and to. Uh, to figure some things out uh, for sure. So I guess uh, maybe my answer is uh, if if AJ starts as poorly against a team like Georgia Southern as he has in some of these others, like that's like at that point it's be like, hey, like you have no choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't expect that. I think I think Michigan State will come out on Tuesday and 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 put a lick in on 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 Georgia Southern. No 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 issues there. Um, I think they have a gap, uh, about a week long gap between that game and, and their next one, unless there's some kind of tournament situation in there where sometimes the, the games aren't listed on ESPN until the matchups are set. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, Big Ten play is, is coming quickly. Um, you usually play, you know, three or four games before the, the turn of the year. Um, and so, and those are important. Like those are, uh, some of the more unpredictable uh, Big Ten games because, you know, everybody's still trying to figure things out at this point. I, I have noticed that uh, this season, when you look around the country, there are so many upsets now in college basketball. Like It's become so common to see um, a program who you would associate with, uh, with uh, past Final Fours and things like that, and they're losing to some uh, very... Uh, just a mid a mid major program, and it kind of mm-hmm. it, it just happens so regularly now. It's it's crazy how much parity there is in college basketball. Um, I would ask you uh, if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the sport, but that's a that's a, a discussion for another time. And we've mm-hmm. gone an hour and a half now here, so um, yeah, no, I think uh, AJ is the guy who um, needs to be who, who needs to be play, uh, who needs to play better. Um, he's mm-hmm. the guy you can point to and say, hey. Uh, you have to like as good as Tyson Walker is, and he, and he is the um, the best player on this team. I do think, and we talked about this before the season. Um, I think Hogard is the guy who will determine the ceiling of this of this team this this season. So it's it's very important to get him um, playing more consistently and off to better starts. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think yeah, he he really drives this team. Um, and yeah, direct them where they want to go. I think, you know, Walker has really stepped up and, you know, picked up a lot of slack for, you know, the, the slow offensive start that they've had this season. Uh, but he can't do it all by himself. And I, you know, you can't, you can't wait for Jackson Kohler to come back to, sure. to, you know, kind of save them in the front court. Uh, you know, they, they're going to play, like you said, they're going to probably play three or four big 10 games, you know, maybe even more than that before Kohler even gets back. So it's, right. it's really important just to, to have, you know, some, some compliment, you know, some compliments off, you know, Walker and, and figure out a, a way to, you know, distribute the scoring and, you know, get, yeah, like get Hogard back on track and, you know, taking, taking better shots. So yeah, that, that's really what they got to look for. Um, because yeah, like you said, the the kind of the the top five, you know, the preseason top five, the you know all conference kind of predictions are they're essentially out the window right now. Um, and now it's just kind of figuring out a way to to get their identity to get their identity back and you know figure 
out a way to, you know, compete in the Big Ten and, and make the NCAA tournament again. Right. No, I completely agree. You, you throw out the preseason projections, you throw out the preseason mm-hmm. expectations, and, and you just start to build now. And, um, you know, it, basketball season is, is a long season. Um, and a lot, a lot is going to happen between now and, and March. And, and ISO teams typically uh, start to turn a corner as you get closer to um, that, that tournament time. I think last year's team is, is a, a good example of that um, as well. So, uh, again, not hitting the panic button here, but I, I completely agree. Throw out the preseason stuff and uh, just start stacking some, some games on top of each other now uh, as we get into to Big Ten play. With that, guys, uh, I think we're going to call it a night. Again, thank you so much for for tuning in and uh, for for hanging around as long as you guys did. Uh, I know an hour and a half is a long time to uh, just listen to a couple of guys uh, uh, jabber back and forth, but we do appreciate it. Um, if you guys could uh, visit our website, uh, www.si.com slash college slash Michigan State. That's where we put up all of our articles. Um, would appreciate any support you guys could provide there. Um, that's how we are able to bring content to you guys for for free, uh, free of charge. Our Facebook page, uh, our website here. So uh, check those out. Uh, give us a follow, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Spartan Nation podcast. Thank you, guys.